So good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who are, uh, are not students and faculty, welcome to Columbia. Um, my name is Trish Mosser. Um, I am the director of the Initiative on Central Banking and Financial Policy here at SIPA, the School of International Public Affairs. Um, this is an interesting initiative since SIPA has been uh, training central bankers for several decades already, uh, not to mention other financial policy makers. Um, uh, but I have enjoyed very much my couple of years here. Um, um, I am a central banker for over 20 years, uh, as well as working at the U.S. Treasury Department for several years, and this is my second time actually around on the Columbia faculty. Um, I was here uh, many, many years ago uh, as an assistant professor. Um, so today's topic, uh, it couldn't be more important or more timely. Um, as everybody here well knows, uh, the Euro area economy is at a turning point. Um, uh, hopefully it's just beyond the edge of that turning point, it looks like anyway. Um, and I, the theme today is I think uh, that the institutions within the Euro area and the institutional structure of the Euro area is also at a turning point. And the big question is what are some of the next steps, what are the wisest ways to move forward. Um, uh, and we have um, three um, uh, incredibly uh, distinguished and expert panelists. Um, um, Pablo Baba, the chairman of ICO, is going to give some introductory remarks. Um, then the main presentation will be um, Fernando Fernandez, um, who is a professor of economics and financial stability at IE Business School. Uh, um, he has pre was previously um, head of research at Banco Santander and, uh, and at the IMF. Um, uh, but most importantly for today's discussion, he is the editor of your, your book. Um, and finally, um, I like the fact that uh, Gonzalo used the word um, rebuttal. I was just going to say discussant, but you know, <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, Paolo Hernando de Cos from the Banco de España, um, who is the Director General um, for Economic Statistics and Research. Um, uh, he is. Um, uh, and serves on the executive board of the ECB. So um, without further ado, I will turn it over to, um, to Mr. Baba and um, let him make a few opening remarks. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Patricia Munchen. It's a pleasure to be here today in Colombia. Dear Consul, the Director of the Spanish Institute, the Economic Consejo of the Spanish Embassy. First of all, of course, I would like to stress my gratitude to Columbia University and for Patricia, Professor Patricia Musen to invite us today and to give us the opportunity to present the year yearbook in the School on International Public Affairs and by doing so, so contributing to debate on the challenging situations of the European Monetary Union. I may say at the beginning I would like to clarify that I'm quite optimistic. I am always been optimistic regarding EU and regarding Eurozone, even in the worst moments of the financial crisis. And so far, I think events have proved that I was right. And I would like to say this as a former member of the European Parliament. I was there as Vice Chairman of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee for seven years. And this uh, optimism, I admit that that was, was shared by everybody. Sometimes even Fernando didn't share my optimism, but <laughs> so far, I think we have reasons to be to be optimistic. This study, as, previous, as in previous years since 2014, has been carried out through the partnership of Fundación y con Fundación Estudios Financieros and under the unvaluable coordination of Professor Fernando Fernández. His expertise has made possible for the Euro year, Yearbook to become a genuine platform of discuss, discussions among experts. I would like to think that this presentation is bound to become an annual appointment with the Euro for all those institutions and individuals concerned about its development and what is more important, the future of the Eurozone and the future and of the Euro European Union. The dating title here in this event, the Euro is dead long life, the Euro deserves this deliberation to observe all possible angles and all possible perspectives. This is what Professor Fernandez and the pool of experts collaborators bring into throughout the executive summary and the 11 chapters of the 2016 uh, yearbook. 
The study offers an overview of the monetary union from its way on a global level to the details and com constraints of the ACB monetary possible and the three different approaches to the hopefully forthcoming fiscally fiscal union. The 2016 edition includes an, an analysis of the challenges to achieve a better Europe, not only more Europe, within the context of Brexit, the context of the refugee crisis, and the latest security th uh, threats. Three factors that have altered the order of priorities. Here we are in the USA, an optimal currency zone and an optimal monetary union. But we have to be aware that uh, not always US was an optimal monetary union and an optimal currency zone. And if it's an optimal monetary union, it's probably thanks to the Hamilton moment. And I hope and I firmly believe we will Europe need its Hamilton moment. And seriously, I firmly believe that sooner the better we will see this Hamilton moment. Otherwise, EU will be allocated to disappear. I think there is no alternative between. But I insist, I hope we will soon see a United States of Europe. Obviously, united in diversity. We have to be aware that Europe is formed by sovereign nations and our linguistic and cultural diversity is bigger than the one that existed in the US. For the EU, the, EU, yeah, the US is a reference of economic united and the evidence of what we aim to be in the near future. In the past, as a member of the European Parliament, I have strongly defended this vision by contributing to create new European financial supervision authorities and the implementation of the European semester to coordinate economic po uh, policies. As Professor Fernandez remarks in the executive summary, these are turbulent times for the European integration. But turbulences and crises are always opportunities, even more in the European Union. The crisis was a test, that, a test case that we are overcoming through advance previously advances previously unthinkable. The banking union, which includes the single supervision mechanism and the single resolution mechanisms, are already in force. But it also includes a single European deposit insurance scheme, EDIS. This has still this has still a long process to go in order to mature. However, the path is already marked. This there there are some polemic about the ambition of EDIS, the ambition of the single European deposit insur uh, insurance scheme. And I think that at this respect, fu I fully trust in the European Parliament to make an EDIS possible, first of all, and uh, make an ambition enough EDIS to cope with the challenges we face. Besides the banking union, Europe is working in a wider approach to implement a complete capital market union. A capital market uh, union will not only uh, deep or economic union, but a capital market union will also help companies to widen its finance sources, making it easier to have a more efficient allocation of both savings and financial investments. Investment constitute a vital instrument for the realization of the European project. The investment the investment plan for Europe, known as Juncker Plan, is mobilizing an amount of 500 billion euros to finance investment in Europe until, the, until 2020, according to the last proposal by, made by the uh, President of the European Commission. ECO, as the Spanish promotional plan, is highly committed with this plan and will keep on accompanying it in the future. The euro, as stated in the chapter prepared by ECOS Research Services, retains all its relevance on the global scene as the second international currency behind the US dollar, but well above any other currency. For all this, I want to be optimistic. We cannot be complacent, however. It must be emphasized that we, are, we were able to leave the crisis behind because of greater integration, and this should be the path to, uh, the path uh, for us to follow in the coming months and in the coming years. I would like to conclude by thanking all authors who have contributed to this yearbook 
with a deep analysis on ECB Kiwi impact on banks' profitability. To our host, Professor Patricia Moser, Director of the Initiative on Central Banking and Financial Policy at the School of International Public Affairs, who has made possible today's presentations and debate. And also to my dear friend, Professor Fernando Fernandez, for his sincere and knowledge leadership of the project. And obviously to Fundación de Estudios Financieros for the sustained quality of work through the years of collaboration. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure to hear for obvious reasons for many of you. Um, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to present the Euro book and to initiate a discussion on the Euro at Colombia at CIPAS. Uh, and thank you to the European uh, Student Association and thank you to the Fundación ICO and the Fundación de Estudios Financieros for its help through this year. What I try to do here in a brief presentation. Is uh, four things. First of all, tell you a little bit what the Euro Research Project is. It's six years uh, trying to both understand and explain what the Euro is about. Um, obviously, we have been very successful because very few people still understand what the Euro is, and certainly very few Americans understand it. Uh, so I can testify by teaching to many American students over seven years that I did in school. Uh, there are many Europeans either, so don't worry, it's not uh, nothing. Then uh, I will try to tell you my view was wrong with you very briefly. Uh, Helping understanding the EU project, uh, some ideas and areas, and initiate some discussions on the main uh, talking points or the main points and conclusions of this year's project. Uh, the, the EU project essentially is a research project that we initiated six years ago, trying to understand what the crisis was about. Essentially, the, the big question was uh, what's going on in Europe? Is it a debt crisis? Is it a currency crisis? Is it an institutional crisis? We still don't have an answer, so I think it's, uh, it's an ongoing issue. Uh, we try to do with a dual perspective, we try to both, as I said, illustrate what the euro is and contribute to make the euro a better, uh, a more sustainable, more stable monetary area, trying to get close to an optimal course and so on, which, as we all know in economics, is one of these ideal reference points which you never reach, but we always try to explain our students how important it is to be there. So as I say, the, euro is a pos the, the euro book is a position paper. It's a position paper trying to identify the problems and, and uh, identify some possible solutions. And it's a collective work, and I want to emphasize this. Every year from the, from the very first year, I had the privilege to be able to incorporate uh, 10, 12, 13 uh, significant authors from different uh, points of view, from the academia, from policy making, from central banks, from ministers of finance, from international institutions, from the IMF, from the European Commission. Even Pablo Grande de Cos has contributed a couple of times in his previous life and in his current energy. Uh, and I think it, it, this is a good point, I mean, because the euro, as I said, is, is a living animal. That we have uh, different ways of how to make it more stable. I will have a different, a very different ideological perspective on the, on the books, too. And uh, we have had the luxury of six years of having, I guess, four ministers of finance already uh, uh, that have written in the euro book, uh, two commissioners. We don't have another prize yet, but uh, eventually we will have one, because I'm sure some of the authors this year uh, but so it's important <laughs> to understand this. Uh, and we continue to do this. I'm very happy that the foundation, I really want to emphasize how, uh, how it is very, and for you here probably in the US, this is not uh, a big deal. But in Spain, let me tell you that having continuous finance for six years, seven actually, because we were working on the new edition, it is something I'm very proud of. I've never been able to do this in my life, and I'm already not too young, uh, to have a continuous support for the same foundation for seven years. Uh, which shows probably not the quality of the paper, but the part of the euro. Uh, the fact that the euro is still there. Every time when I start uh, the new book, I say, well, what am I going to say this? And you know, the Europeans are very good at creating a new problem that I try to explain the next one. And obviously, this year, I have many problems to understand. Let me, let me start uh, quickly with three uh, quotes, which I think uh, the first one comes from Larry Summers, which you all probably know. Uh, and it, it, uh, it, you should know. Uh, and it indicates to me uh, a very good summary of the, what I call the American view of the Euro. To, to put it very, in my own words, uh, when I was here, I was here at Geneva in 96, uh, where, where the Euro, here I mean the US, uh, while the, the Euro was being made, and the general consensus in, in the States was the Euro is a bad idea. Well, first of all, it would never happen, so you, know, you guys in Europe are very weird, and you, uh, 
insiste no se devuelve a Happy. Y si Happy se vuelve a mes, y si Racho es Happy se vuelve a Word. Y then I'll try, I will try to convince you where Will has Word. No, but Larry Summers wrote in on the Financial Times a really provocative piece, and he basically quoted something that you here at SIPA probably know, which is the Pentagon Papers, and it should be uh, very uh, well known to you. He said, policymakers acted with illusion. At every juncture, they made a minimum. I don't have my glasses, I can't hear you there. <laughs> Sorry. The minimum commitments necessary to avoid imminent disaster, offering optimistic, optimistic rhetoric, but never taking the steps that even they believed could offer the prospects of a decisive victory. Ultimately, after years of needless suffering, their policy collapsed. Essentially, the euro is not a bad idea, but the way you're dealing with the euro is the worst possible way. Always promising and never delivering. And this has been going on for you. And we could say the same today. And this is probably uh, what the Americans say. Uh, the second quote comes from a very well-known European politician, which wrote way back in history in 2001, Romano Prodi. I'm convinced that the euro will force us to introduce a new set of instruments for economic policy. It is politically impossible to propose those instruments now, but someday there will be a crisis and new policy tools will be implemented. So this speaks to two things. One, we were not that stupid in Europe when we started the euro project. We knew there were many design flaws, there were many institutional problems, but this is as far as it was possible, politically possible, to go at that time. And we knew that there were things that would have to be changed and corrected, revised, implemented over time. Uh, and we, as, as usual, uh, we expected for a big crisis to come and they would solve the problem. Now, certainly nobody, not even Romano probably ever thought that a crisis would be this big, uh, but we also never thought that will become this way. I mean, I, I always remember a, a, a conference thing. Oh, I was there. Uh, you may not have been there. Uh, in, in 2011, at uh, the German uh, Minister of Finance, we were having a conference on the euro, and everything was going beautifully until I mentioned the word banking. Uh, and then a very important politician in Germany, the chairman of the Savings Banks Association, which, as you probably know, is probably one of the most important finance personalities in the country, rose up and said, I will dedicate the rest of my life to make sure that the banking union never happens. Uh, after 30 seconds of hesitation on my part and, and considerable fear, uh, I came up with a sentence which I repeat ever since, which is, uh, well, you better dedicate the rest of your life to make sure that then peace in Europe connects. Because if we don't have a banking union, we will not have the euro, and then we will have serious social and political problems in Europe. Uh, the fact is that we do have today a banking in, uh, which can be improved, certainly, but we do have it. Uh, and this is important. I mean, we in Europe have been able to revise and correct things that we never thought it was possible. We never thought it was possible to common supervision, and yeah. probably you were the European Parliament there. And we have it today. I mean, there are things that we can improve, and the book is about telling you what things don't work, and what things we still need to improve. And, uh, but certainly, we do have a banking union for a practical purpose. We are much closer to a fiscal union, or to at least to having fiscal rules that work, that we never thought we could. Yeah. Uh, we're still a long way to go. Uh, and of course, again, the discussion is what needs to be done. But we're there. Anyway, the third part, uh, it's something that I'm really keen on in Europe. And this is uh, to talk about how the world sees us in Asia. Because one of the problems with the European dialogue is that we think about ourselves. Eventually, we think about the US. But we never think about the world. And as uh, somebody from the uh, National Bank in China once said, globalization is the source of the European agony. So the problem is about competing in a world, not just competing with the US. OK, this quote brings me to this chart, which is the one you've probably seen. This is the, what I call the European disenchantment, where you see the US growing consistently faster than Europe ever since the euro was started. Now, this is not bad, not necessarily bad. We've grown more than Asia, than Japan. <coughs> but then I go here, and this is probably what Americans say now. This is the, uh, the relative GDP performance since the start of the crisis, since the start of the, uh, of the uh, euro, uh, in different countries. Uh, we have certainly, uh, from the start of the crisis in 2008, up until now. So uh, what you see is with European divergence. By the way, very few people in this room knew before you came that the performance of Spain is much better than Italian economic performance since the crisis. And I'm sure no Italians have told you this. And not, what is more amazing to me is no Spaniard has even known this. Uh, you know, we're so mirrored in our economic crisis that we tend to forget some obvious points. And, uh, and that point is that we have had a very significant recovery in growth, uh, which has not been part of uh, part of many other European countries. But the problem is, Again, the internal differences and disparities within the Union have increased. 
In fact, if you go to this chart, which I will not explain, uh, I will show you. This is what any American look at. Okay. How is it possible to have a monetary union when you have, on, as you look at it on the left uh, upper uh, graph here, you have, you have the unemployment differences from the average. I, I didn't endeavor to include the German unemployment rate because then the chart would be ridiculously large, from 4% to 23%. Uh, this is the disturbance. Uh, then you have unit labor costs on the other side. You have the balance of payments, uh, surplus and deficits on the down, and then you have a fiscal, a very complex, complex a little complicated uh, uh, chart of fiscal performance where the, the size of the dots is the size of debt to GDP ratio. The position is the, uh, the primary balances, that is uh, before interest payments, and then it's plotted to do with uh, GDP growth. But the idea is huge fiscal discrepancies, huge fiscal current account discrepancies, huge fiscal employment disparities, how come this can be a monetary union? Well, the thing that nobody knows is that if you look at this in the US, it's not very different. If you look at the, at the story between the 50 different states in the US, what is on employment, GDP growth, fiscal positions, etc., they're not very different. The real difference, though, and here in SIPA, this is important, is that nobody in the world, I've never seen, and I know Pablo, both Pablo's correct me if I'm wrong, I've never seen any investment banker, I've never seen any academic paper uh, that has Envisage the possibility that, let's say, Kansas or California would solve these economic problems by going away from the US dollar monetary zone, yes. uh, by devaluing. Uh, whereas I'm sick of reading investment bank papers or academic papers or even our papers, contemplated the possibility that a European monetary union country, Greece, eventually Portugal, eventually Spain, eventually Italy, may decide to solve these problems by breaking the monetary union. Now, this is a political fact, and, and, and here you, you know this better than economists. I mean, the fact is that people will look at the European Monetary Union as an unstable position. And as I always make this joke, I had to, uh, uh, I would love to be a soccer player, I was too short and bald, and, and I couldn't make it, so I had to be an economist. Uh, and that's fine, I'm not a too bad of an economist. Well, the euro has to sustain monetary union, despite the fact that nobody else in the world would ever believe that monetary union will be sustainable. So we have to deal with this, but we have to make sure that we don't incre that we increase the anxiety and the, the instability of the union, but adding institutional features that will increase the, in the lack of stability or the lack of economic performance of the union. That will make the union uh, flexible enough to respond to challenges, institutionally as close to a monetary union, to an optimal closing zone as possible, etc. Okay. Uh, then, I don't know why. Oh, okay. We got to change it. We didn't change it. Uh, I, this is the, the basics of the of the uh, monetary union, the, the Maastricht Treaty, which I'm sure you all know. And if you don't know, you will by the end of your studies here at CEPAS, I'm sure. So we're going to just let me emphasize two points. Uh, when the euro was introduced, the monetary union uh, was introduced. It was just a, 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 a monetary. Union. There was no banking union. There was no fiscal union. Well, in fact, we had fiscal rules which were never implemented. Uh, so to, for all practical purposes, there were no fiscal rules. Uh, there were three, and we could discuss it, we discussed this for many years, but the fact is they were never implemented. We, we in Spain uh, take pride and say that the first ones that never made the fiscal rule were Germany, uh, but that's okay, but it doesn't help. I mean, the fact is that nobody else has ever made the rules or really didn't have the fiscal rule. But the funny thing is that people tend to forget that it worked very well. It worked very well for 10 years. It worked both in terms of economic growth, low inflation, and in the convergence, up until the US decided to screw it with the financial system. And then we had a huge crisis in the world. Now, the question is not why the US decided to do that, which is fine, but why the financial crisis took a huge hit on the European uh, financial architecture. Uh, there was no reason except the fact that we had some problem within Europe. And this is you know, the financial crisis underlying some of the problems we had in Europe. But let me go very briefly, very quickly, over the fee crisis that I'm sure you've heard of many, many times. Uh, as some of the uh, professors here at uh, Colombia have been very adamant in, in uh, uh, some of the things that I've said, uh, with a very different view. So I will not uh, take issue with anyone who's not present, but very, let me give you my view of the three basic crises, Greece, Ireland, and Portugal. Greece is a fiscal crisis, as everybody knows. Uh, and the, the question is not how the Greece got away with cheating 10 years in a row on the fiscal deficit, uh, but how the European Union did not have elements to control that fact. 
so uh, it uh, raised issues of information problems, uh, fiscal policy externalities, uh, implementation <coughs> rules. I mean, you, know, you can have very beautiful rules, but then nobody implements them. What is the use of them? And more importantly, it put on the table the issue of does you would need a stabilization fund? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. We've tried ever since 2010 to first create and improve uh, uh, the stabilization fund, the so-called ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, uh, which is still not perfect, still, in my view, does have no firing power, does have the ability to learn itself. Uh, it, it relates too much on what I call the IMF approach, and I work at IMF for years. The IMF approach is you know, you put stringent conditions attached to loans. Uh, the, the conditions are never met, so you then you get put in a situation where you have to rely to relax the conditions or give waivers uh, or uh, let the company bankrupt. But the basic problem to me with the stabilization fund approach, this discussion is still going on with many people in Europe calling for a European stabilization fund uh, or, the, or actually a European monetary fund, as I'm saying the current discussion today. The problem to me of that is that this may work where, uh, outside the monetary union, where like at the IMF, countries are not members of a large union. It is alone. What the European monetary union needs is a common fiscal policy. It's a common fiscal stance. It's a common euro treasury. You know, I know that this is very, uh, uh, the implications of this are very dire, uh, politically and economically, but I think we have no escape for that eventually. We can discuss how much that, that is. Uh, but that's uh, one of the conclusions of the book. We have ever since the beginning. Uh, second case, Ireland. Ireland is a uh, financial free right, but basically Ireland puts on the table two basic questions. One, how do you recapitalize a banking system without a central bank? Uh, which was the question in Ireland. I mean, the three large banks went bankrupt overnight. No country in the world will let the three largest banks uh, go under. Uh, but Ireland did not have tools to deal with that problem. So what they did, they broke the rules. They basically saved the banks, and they then went to Brussels and said, too bad, but this is what I had to do last night. Now find out a way to make this possible. Well, to make it legal. It is possible, but to make it legal. And this is how banking business started, essentially. But there was no other way. In no other country in the world would have been happy enough for the European Monetary Union. This happened in Ireland, which is a small country. Uh, the implications for financial stability that was Euro Bank was small. Yeah, you know, I dare not to imagine what would have happened if the banking crisis, the initial banking would have been needed. Uh, then we would have a serious problem uh, in 2010. Uh, because they wouldn't do Now, what we did after that, what we did after Ireland, try to solve the problem uh, by stepping uh, faster towards banking in. Now, we have, as I said, created a European Central Bank, in, uh, sorry, a European supervision, uh, uh, the, the, the SSM, Single Supervisory Mechanism. Uh, which was initiated in November 2014, which essentially means now that every single European bank is supervised by a uh, common institution. Uh, as I said to my colleagues in, in Spain or in Italy, uh, the funny thing is now that the Bank of Spain, for all practical purposes, is a very prestigious uh, research department. Uh, but it has no teeth whatsoever. Anything that is relevant to a bank is decided in Frankfurt. And I know Paolo will disagree with me, that's his but it is good that it's that is the case. So the Bank of Spain is like the local uh, branch of the, uh, uh, the local branch in Kansas of the uh, Kansas probably too large. The local branch in in uh, um, I don't want to be rude anymore, so. <laughs> the local branch of the, of the Federal Reserve in a very small place. Uh, but this is good because that ensures that it, we are getting closer to a level playing field for banks. Uh, we are close to banks having the same rules in terms of capital, in terms of assets. Uh, when I say we're getting close, and the book is about how far we're still from there, because uh, it, it is interesting for you to know that we still don't agree on what a bad asset is. We don't agree what a non-performing loan is. Uh, despite the fact that ever since 2014, the uh, SSM has been dealing with the so-called options and discretions, national options and discretions, that is the legacy definitions in supervision. Uh, we're still a long way to go. Uh, and all this process that the ECB is now, the SSM, involved in reducing bad assets and making sure that the, the non-performing uh, portfolio of European mines declines, faces one basic question. We still don't know, or we still do not have a common definition of what non-performing loan is across Europe, and certainly we have no common provision rules for non-performing loans. And this 
creates a, a, a mind, let's say, profit. But the fact is that we're working towards that, and this is something we never believe, and this is something we have to leverage. And then we have Portugal. Portugal is the most difficult possible case, because Portugal was not about fiscal rules, Portugal was not about monetary rules, Portugal was about structural rules and lack of growth. Now, how do you impose growth on a country if the country doesn't want to grow? It's a good question for you guys here at, uh, at uh, uh, CIPAS to deal with. Uh, but the problem is if that country doesn't want to grow, and then it creates a problem to everybody else, what do you do? Because the main issue with exit, you know, one of the rules that it was in a, a, one of the basic rules that to me has to be maintained ever in monetary union is the no exit rule. And the no exit rule, which was in a treaty, uh, in two ways. One, no, no country can leave, and no, no country can be thrown out. And the reason for that is very simple. If one country leaves, nobody would ever believe us that, that, that another country would then leave. So then the, uh, the benefits expected to derive from monetary union in terms of stability, low inflation, long-term financing, etc., etc., stability for the banks would always be put in question, especially for periphery countries. But then no country can be thrown out. Now, the only way to reconcile those things is by making sure that you have rules that can be implemented and uh, uh, installed in a country. Now, of course, I know that this uh, talks about democracy. It talks about uh, so a transfer of sovereignty. And this is the whole issue today. I mean, I, I could go on and on, and I think I'm, by, by looking at somebody's face, I'm speaking too long already. Uh, so let me just uh, uh, go to the very... There's a message on this screen that uh, is my okay, wait. Sorry. So let me just go to the very last. The four issues that uh, that the, the 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 book is about: uh, political disenchantment. Uh, the problem is, as I, to put it very bluntly, to, to summarize, economies are going as far as possible. This is all we can do for the monetary union. It's a question for policy makers now. The issues are on the table, the answers to the problems are there, the different strategies to deal with fiscal union or monetary are there. It is a question of transferring sovereignty and of political will. And my concern is, Pablo, Pablo Fallon, correct me if I'm wrong, my concern is that the EU of today is worried, is using its scarce cap political capital on other issues, which are present, I mean, refugee crisis, uh, security issues, this is all very important. But we still need a lot of political capital to be invested in improving and bettering and making monetary union stable. And that I don't see. Uh, second, unconventional monetary policy and ECB. I will let this to Pablo where we disagree. This is a discussion we will have in every monetary union. Uh, the book is a lot about the unconventional monetary policy. My basic question is it was necessary, but it's, it has lasted too long. The sooner we leave from this uh, zero interest rate and negative interest rate for deposits, uh, the better. It's only creating more problems than solving. But, uh, this is a discussion that is only partially, in my way, related to monetary union, because this is a discussion about the stance of monetary policy that we would have in every central bank in the world, being it a monetary union, a country, forever. We will have this discussion with the Bank of Spain and with the Bank of Cancer. So it's not really a monetary union issue, except for one minor point, which is creates internal discrepancies between the Germans and the Italians, the Spaniards, and uh, the Dutch. It does aggravate the internal tension of the union because what you see, it is perceived by some as a silent, non-transparent source of fiscal transfers. So this is the only reason why the unconventional monetary policy is a monetary union issue, and not a simply monetary policy issue too. And it's something we have to take into consideration. A, a large part of the German discontent with the state of the union, the monetary union, has to do with negative interest rates, with the fact that they feel their tax pay is being mistreated because I say as saving a lot of money. Uh, third issue, uh, of course, fiscal union. Again, to, to summarize the, the discussion in the book very, very briefly, there are still, at this point, two views on fiscal union. One is, let's have a very relaxed fiscal union where we essentially the different member states, different countries will keep fiscal policy and will have some sort of convergence at the top. We'll have, first of all, this very uh, Anglo Saxon view of uh, what I call what they call, complain and explain. You know, you have rules that you have to either complain, uh, meet them, or uh, do not meet them, and then tell me why you don't meet them. This is very nice, but it doesn't work. 
Second, very nice Anglo-Saxon approach, peer pressure. You know, we'll identify you as very bad guys. Fine, we're used to it, so what else? You know, you know that the Italians and the Greeks and the Spaniards don't compare, so it doesn't work either. So I think we do need to address the issue that we need fiscal rules, and we need, therefore, a fiscal institution that has the political legitimacy to take fiscal decisions for living. We need a European treasury that has the political legitimacy. We need to build institutions for the Eurozone. By the way, this is a very important problem that here on CIPAS that will be glad for you to take up at some point, because any institution within the monetary union is actually the institution of the European Union, not the European Monetary Union. Now, we now are very happy, quote unquote, with Brexit, because the assumption here is, since Brexit is Great Britain is going to leave the Union, then we can make the presumption that everybody else in the, month in the European Union will eventually adopt the Euro. So we will not have this difference between the European Union and the European Monetary Union in the future. Now that to me is, allow me, sorry, Bush, this is a very uh, uh, optimistic, Pablo, even for you, a very optimistic view of the immediate future. It may happen, but it will take so long that it's irrelevant. We have to address the issue that we need institutions for the euro area, uh, especially if we're going to build fiscal policy at the euro area, if we're going to have the euro treasury. The euro treasury, remember, the origin of states, the origin of parliaments, is this idea to limit the power of the king to impose taxes. So we're going to do this to, uh, to the euro. We're going to grant authority to tax the European tax base at the European level, we need to have institutions for the euro. But this is, this is a, a one of the, the points. And the last point, uh, which I will not go into, is the latest European banking regulation. I mean, there's still a lot of nitty gritty, a lot of details. I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> I didn't go into your field, but I'm very glad to discuss it <laughs> later. Uh, there are many, many different issues, but let me quote one uh, um, professor, actually, I think it's. Campana Professor Di Campo was Professor Lee or NYU? Yeah, sorry if, uh, if it was uh, NYU, I'm sorry. Uh, a very significant <laughs> Spanish. So who is now uh, the Director of Regulation Policy at Santander, at Bank of Santander. Uh, so Robert Campa, who writes the, the, the chapter of regulatory policy in the book. And he ends up saying, we are a long way from a level playing field for European banks. Uh, we, but we have also moved a long way because we know what needs to be done which we didn't know 10 years, or three years, even two years ago. We know where the difference is. Again, we need to take the political decisions. We need to, and we need to decide on the transition period, because of course, the different banks in Europe respond to the different legislation. So you cannot expect the banks to adapt the same regulations in one year, because the legacy is there. The balance sheet reflects the regulation, and you cannot impose a common regulation without giving them time to adjust the balance sheet. So the good news is we know what needs to be done, the bad, the bad news is we still don't agree how to get there. Uh, with that idea on, on, on mind, I'm sorry for being so long. I will uh, let the floor to. Uh, oh. kind uh, invitation. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to try to rebound or to comment. Maybe what I will try to expand <laughs> on at least uh, two issues that are uh, particularly relevant from the point of view of uh, Central Bank, uh, even a small Central Bank uh, like the one that uh, <laughs> 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 um, So I will try to convince you on two, uh, on two issues. One, uh, the first one on monetary policy and the second one on fiscal policy. Uh, on the first one, obviously, I will try to defend what the European Central Bank has done. Uh, and contrary to what Fernando has said, I will try also to convince you that the presence of the ECB is still needed. Uh, and on fiscal policy, my main point, and also related to what Fernando has uh, just said, is, uh, of course, money, uh, fiscal policy was not there during the crisis. Okay? So we don't have, of course, uh, a unique uh, budget for the Eurozone. Uh, for the Eurozone. There is no a mechanism uh, either uh, in order to force some country uh, that is in a good position to do an expansionary for the fiscal policy that can help the rest of the, of the, of the area, area. 
And this is why I will try to defend uh, during my, my presentation that there is a need of, uh, of a change in the, the way the governance, uh, the fiscal governance of the new area is currently uh, managed. So let me start with, uh, with monetary policy. And maybe it's interesting, in order to make uh, this justification I was, uh, I was uh, emphasizing, to go back to where the euro area was uh, at the beginning of 2014. And basically here what you have is uh, several charts. I think the right uh, hand chart is very similar to the one that Fernando was, uh, was providing. Um, as you can see, at the beginning of 2014, the euro area was uh, in a much worse situation as compared to the UK and uh, for sure uh, to the uh, uh, USA. Uh, we suffered this double uh, depreciation, the double depreciation which was basically a euro area uh, depreciation because uh, not the UK nor uh, the US were suffering it. Uh, so the, there was a clear underperforming uh, of uh, the euro area economy. And then on, on inflation, and then I move to the, to the left part of the, of the slide, as you can see, there were clear s uh, signals of the anchoring of inflation expectations. And if you look at the, at the, at the graph on the, uh, at the bottom, you can see this is a measure of uh, euro area medium and long-term inflation expectations that were clearly below this 2% target, that is the, the, the objective of the ECB. And even euro area inflation on the, uh, was uh, even negative. For some, for, some, for some months. So this uh, situation is the justification for the reaction, the strong reaction, I would say, of monetary policy. Um, the ECB introduced a series of non-conventional measures that uh, I can, I'm summarizing in, the, in these slides. Uh, first, uh, it reduces official interest rates, the deposit facility rate, which is the main uh, interest rate uh, in a situation like the one we are uh, now uh, move into negative territory to minus 0.4%, and this is uh, currently still the, the case, uh, as you can see in the, in, the, in, the, in the chart. And then there was a mm, uh, very significant balance sheet expansion on, on two ways. And on, on the first one is a very much uh, uh, European or Euro area uh, style, uh, which is a clearly credit easing uh, through targeted long term financing uh, to banks, the so called TLTLO1 and TLTLO2. And the more now traditional quantitative easing, similar to what the, the, the reserve, reserve, uh, Federal Reserve did, which is a large scale outright purchases of assets through the, uh, the so called extended asset purchase program, through which basically the ECB uh, buys cover bonds, uh, uh, asset based securities, public sector securities, non bank corporate bonds. Um, and then uh, finally, as uh, many other central banks during this period, the ECB started to provide guidance on the likely uh, forward path of monetary policy. This is uh, or, uh, starting to give indications on what would, might happen with interest rates in the, uh, in the uh, <coughs> term and also with non-standard measures. As a way to, uh, to uh, describe how strong these measures were, uh, it is perhaps uh, interesting to see what happened with the balance sheet of the European Central uh, Bank. So as, as a purchases started in March uh, 2015, by uh, the ECB was buying 16 billion uh, per month, and there were several uh, extensions. Uh, uh, currently, the, this asset purchases will run at least until end uh, 2017. So, uh, all in all, the monetary uh, stimulus uh, increased the uh, balance sheet of the bank by 30% of uh, GDP, which is, uh, as you can imagine, a very uh, big uh, number. So um, what was trying to, to do the ECB with this type of message? So this is, um, I, guess, I guess that uh, Professor Moser has explained it uh, to you in, in class. But this is uh, basically uh, this non-standard measures, so this uh, uh, quantitative easing, credit easing, forward guidance, negative policy rates. Basically, what they do through different channels, I'm not going to enter uh, now, what they are trying to do is to ease financial conditions okay, for households, for banks, even for the public sector, and through this easing of financial conditions to provide an stimulus to aggregate demand, and in the end, through this stimulus into, uh, of aggregate demand, also to an increase uh, on, in, in prices. How does this policy work? Well, this uh, is a chart on which I'm trying to summarize what has happened with financial conditions in the euro area. There are uh, a number of variables, so if, uh, if we concentrate on the right uh, hand chart, mm -hmm. the red bullet points are the changes in financial conditions on interest rates for Germany, interest rates for the euro area, interest rates for the periphery countries, in this case Spain and Italy, interest rates for the corporate bonds, 
And then on the uh, right part of the chart, you have the exchange rate and uh, the, uh, the stock exchange. And as you can see, there was a clear decline. These uh, bullet points are much lower between 2014 and 2017. And the blue part uh, of it is what, according to our models, or to our empirical evidence uh, at least, is uh, what can be uh, explained by the monetary easing of the ECB. And uh, basically, the main conclusion of, uh, of this graph is a, a huge part of the easing of monetary conditions in the Euro area was uh, based on the decisions taken by the European uh, Central Bank. So uh, today, uh, of course, this easing of monetary condition has uh, affected also the real economy. And uh, this is a chart that, that was also presented by, by Fernando but, but with most, uh, more recent numbers and also with the projections for the different countries uh, of the European uh, Commission. And as you can see, uh, now uh, GDP growth is, uh, is growing in most of the EU area countries. In fact, for most, uh, except for the case of Italy, uh, of these EU area countries, the level of GDP today uh, is uh, higher than the one that was observed in 2007, so just before the, the crisis. Um, if you look at the right hand chart now, the, this, um, this uh, robust uh, economic uh, recovery is basically driven by domestic demand, contrary to what happened at the beginning of the recovery period, which was basically the external sector, which is a signal again that consumption and even private investment is uh, responding to this issue of financial uh, condition. And maybe it's also interesting to emphasize that this recovery uh, has navigated well um, with a huge ge geopolitical uncertainty. Geopolitical uncertainty that has came, of course, from this country, but also from Brexit, and, but even from European countries with several uh, elections in, in different countries in, in, in Europe uh, that uh, took place during this uh, period that uh, introduced a lot of uncertainty uh, in, in, in those uh, countries and in the Euro area uh, as a whole. Um, maybe as a way uh, to see even more clear uh, that um, this expansion is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is relatively robust, I'll look at this, these two charts. So the first one, the one on the, on the left, is basically a measure of dispersion of, um, of uh, value-added growth, uh, growth across uh, Euro area countries and uh, sectors. And as you can see, this dispersion, the level of dispersion, is at the minimum uh, level since the beginning of the European Monetary Union. So basically, most of the sectors, most of the countries are now growing, <coughs> which is, a, of course, a very positive outcome. And then the second, uh, uh, maybe, uh, element to be emphasized is what it is illustrated in the right-hand chart, which is uh, that um, this uh, recovery is also very intensive in employment creation, which, of course, for a, uh, for a region, for a, uh, a jurisdiction like the Euro area on which and employment rate increased a lot during the crisis is a very relevant factor, and this is providing confidence also to, uh, to, the, to, the, to households and, uh, and, to, and to firms, and this, of course, is also having a positive effect on, on consumption. So, is this all? Um, well, this is, uh, in this graph, I'm just uh, 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 an estimation, according to the Bank of Spain's estimates of of the growth rate of the euro area between the, in the period 2015 and 17, what can be uh, basically uh, um, thought to be uh, forced by the euro area, sorry, by the ECB monetary policy. So the, 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 the numbers, if I can summarize them, is that uh, according to these estimates, about 50% of nominal GDP growth, so both including the real uh, GDP growth and inflation during the, this period can be attributed to the action of monetary policy since 2014. And maybe an element that I wanted to, uh, to emphasize, because I know that uh, Fernando is also very worried about this, is what it is uh, illustrated in the right-hand chart, is that basically mm, it's an estimation on what the impact has been of all these measures on bank profitability. Uh, and as uh, you can see, it is true that, um, uh, of course, a low interest rate environment has a negative effect on the net, in net interest income of banks. Uh, this, yellow, uh, this yellow bars in these graphs for countries and also for the average of the EU area. But according to our estimates, at least, of the European Central Bank estimates in, the case, in this case, this is at least until uh, now has been compensated for uh, uh, an improving of uh, the quality of, uh, of the loans. Uh, okay, well, this is uh, an important factor, which is the degree bar, and also to, uh, for uh, an, an, an increase of the profits coming from capital gains which are also derived from these assets buying that I was uh, mentioning uh, before. So that in net terms, basically, the effect of the, uh, the ECB measures on uh, bank profitability is basically negligible. Um, 
Is this all? And now I'm trying to, to answer to this, uh, to this question. Well, uh, the question uh, uh, has to be answered looking at the target of the European Central Bank. And here what you have is basically on the left-hand chart uh, euro area inflation. And euro area inflation has remained very volatile, uh, and basically reflecting the ups and downs of, uh, of oil uh, prices. But if you look uh, to core inflation, core inflation is basically the inflation without the elements that are more uh, volatile. Okay, so it's the, those uh, that um, that uh, so excluding uh, basic, basically energy and, and, and process uh, goods, uh, f uh, food. Uh, sorry, uh, you see that core inflation has remained relatively close to one percent, only with a peak up uh, in the last two or three months to one point three percent. So, but it still is very far away from this two percent target of the European Central Bank. And even if I take the projections of the European Central Bank, which is at these uh, blue uh, dots that are in the, the left-hand chart, you see that uh, the recovery of this inflation rate towards the, uh, the inflation aim is, uh, is very lengthy. Yeah. And then if you move to the inflation expectations, this is the same chart that I was presenting before, but now concentrated uh, uh, on, on, on the last, uh, on the last uh, period. What you can see is that uh, also market-based indicators of long-term inflation expectations remain at low levels. The blue line is the euro area, it's below, clearly below 2%, and clearly below, the, for example, the, the, this, uh, the, the level of this variable for the, for the US. So uh, what uh, the, the ECB uh, has basically provided in terms of communication uh, to the to markets and to, to, to citizens is uh, basically uh, the, the decisions taken in, 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 in the last meeting of the Governing Council of the ECB at the beginning of September. Basically, the ECB is expecting to keep the ECB uh, interest rates uh, uh, unchanged or at the present levels for an extended period of time. This is one one of the uh, elements of the communication. Second, the, uh, the ECB also confirmed that the net assets purchase at the monthly pace of 60 billion uh, are intended to run until the end of December uh, 2017 or beyond, and what is important and stress, uh, if necessary, and, uh, until the governing council sees a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation. And uh, the governing council also informed that they, uh, it uh, will decide on the uh, regulation of the policy instruments in the following months, in particular. The, the, so what the market is expecting uh, currently for the European Central Bank, and uh, this is illustrated in these uh, two charts. If, if, uh, in, the in the right hand chart, what you can see is basically the one year forward uh, interest rate. And uh, basically the message is that the market is not expecting any interest rate increase with a probability higher of 50% until the beginning of 2019. Okay. Uh, and then on the on the asset purchase program, this is a uh, what is in this table is a plumber survey that uh, is done uh, the, um, the days before uh, any governing council meeting, uh, the meeting of the uh, of the ECB uh, of monetary policy, of course, uh, for of, uh, 60 economies. And basically, the main message from this table is that the markets are currently expecting that the ECB uh, will extend the asset purchase pro program for at least uh, nine months. At least on, on, on the median estimate is for nine months, although with probably with lower uh, monthly uh, purchases. So this uh, is related to monetary policy. And then uh, to, uh, to fiscal policy, of course, many economies, including here in the US, have been emphasizing that uh, the, uh, during this situation I was describing at the beginning, where we, are, we were uh, at the beginning of 2014, uh, it was uh, not, uh, not only necessary an expansion uh, of monetary policy, but also of fiscal uh, policy. Um, and there were several arguments that were made, and I will try to use uh, some, some of them. The first one is that, of course, the, the monetary uh, policy expansion was also giving more fiscal space uh, to, to governments, in the sense, of course, that this reduction of interest rates I, I was emphasizing before was, of, of course, reducing the interest payments of, uh, of, uh, of the general government sector in the euro area. And here you have an estimate of what uh, this impact has been. And the numbers are relatively significant. For example, if you take uh, the countries like Italy or, or Spain, the estimated direct impact of the ECB uh, purchase program on the, the decline of interest payments is uh, uh, around one percentage point of GDP, which is a, a, big, a, big, a big number. And you have to take into account that here is uh, only uh, included the effect that it comes directly for interest rate, but if, of course if you want to consider also the effect of having higher uh, GDP growth and this higher GDP growth uh, also providing lower uh, unemployment rate and lower unemployment benefits, even then, then these numbers will be even uh, higher. A second argument that was also used, again uh, here uh, in the US was, uh, was uh, also very much emphasized, is that of course uh, the cost of financing a fiscal expansion in an environment of uh, low interest rates was, uh, of course, uh, uh, much, uh, much, uh, much lower. 
Uh, and uh, uh, even if you think that uh, with a expansionary fiscal uh, policy, the ECB in this uh, situation, which was very exceptional, was not, uh, was not going uh, to react uh, in, a, in, a, in a restrictive uh, manner, then the, the, the arguments in order to do a fiscal policy expansion were even higher. And here, would, uh, it is illustrated in, the, in this chart, is precisely this, uh, this, um, this uh, argument. Um, uh, this, the, 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 the blue line is what happens uh, with, uh, in, in a normal situation. So you have uh, one country, if you are in the, in the core uh, country, which is the, the right-hand chart, uh, makes an expansion of 1% response of GDP. The, the, the here is illustrated with a multiplier, uh, so the impact on GDP is around 0.5. What happens with the peripheral countries? So what uh, let's uh, call, call countries, uh, Germany, for example, what's uh, happening with the, the growth of peripheral countries? Well, since in normal circumstances, when uh, Germany makes a uh, fiscal expansion, the ECB will increase interest rates, then it will have a negative effect on the uh, real GDP growth of peripheral countries, uh, as it is seen in the, right, in the graph on the left. But in the uh, exceptional circumstances that we were uh, living uh, during these uh, uh, three years, of course, if uh, the core country, this uh, German uh, expansion uh, fiscal policy, uh, of course, the multiplier is much higher because the monetary policy is not reacting. And also the spillover, and then I move to the left-hand uh, chart, the spillover to the periphery countries is also very significant. So basically what we are saying is that it, according to this estimates, at least a 1% uh, expansion of, uh, um, of fiscal policy in Germany will have a very positive effect on Germany in terms of real GDP growth, 1.4, around 1.4. Uh, uh, and uh, it will have also a non negligible impact on periphery countries of around 0 0.5, 0 0.6 in the, in the very short term. So this, is, this was the argument that was used basically by the academia during this, uh, during this, uh, during this period. Uh, of course, uh, if you uh, take into account that uh, mm, there are some uh, uh, elements of the budget that ha might have even uh, higher multipliers, I'm referring, for example, for public investment, uh, the multipliers, and this is an illustration in this chart, the, these multipliers, uh, the spillovers of these multipliers to the periphery countries of an expansion of public investment in Germany might even be bigger. And the fear is illustrated that after one year it could be close to uh, 1%. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a very significant, uh, very significant uh, number. So, what happened in reality? Well, in reality, uh, as uh, it is illustrated in the right hand chart, basically it did happen in nothing. So, the, 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 the um, Germany <coughs> didn't expand for sure. And in general, the change in structural primary balance, which is a, normally the indicator that it is used in order to measure whether there is an expansion or a contraction of fiscal policy, was basically neutral during all this, uh, during the, all this period. And basically, why this was the case? Is, uh, it was the case, well, first, because there were a good number of countries, uh, and it, this is illustrated on the left hand chart of the, of the graph, that uh, ha uh, had higher debt and higher structural deficit than the one that uh, is uh, uh, set by the stability and growth pact. And there were only a few countries, in particular Germany, the Netherlands, those that are under this uh, red uh, bubble uh, there, that were in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sound uh, position. Uh, but of course, the fiscal framework of uh, the euro area does not provide any incentive for, this, uh, uh, for these countries to do an expansion in order to help the periphery countries. Okay? And of course, we don't even uh, have a, 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 a single budget a strong budget by uh, the European Commission or the European Council that can substitute this uh, uh, expansion by one country. Okay? This is why Indian fiscal uh, expansion didn't take place uh, during this, uh, during this uh, period. Um, this is an important, uh, uh, I think, drawback of the uh, monetary union. And here I'm providing a graph on which uh, basically uh, is uh, comparing four uh, areas, the EU area, the United States, uh, Canada, and, and Germany. And it's basically what this graph is uh, trying to illustrate is what's, what's happened when one region of these uh, four uh, areas suffers a negative shock, okay? How it is smooth uh, in, in the different regions. So, so the yellow part is the one that uh, is not smooth, okay? So it's basically suffered by the own region as it's not compensated by any positive developments in other, uh, in other, in other regions. Um, the green bar is the role that uh, uh, credit markets uh, play. Okay, and it's, of course, it's playing even the euro area a significant, uh, a significant uh, role. The blue line is uh, what capital markets uh, do, so that they, they compensate this negative shock by providing, for example, funds to this region from other, uh, from other regions. 
Um, and then the red line is uh, uh, when, uh, when there is a role for this, uh, what, uh, what is the impact of fiscal transfers from one region to the other. Okay? So there are here, there are, there are two things that have to be emphasized in the case of the euro area. The first one is that uh, the, 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 the smooth part is much bigger. Okay, so when, the, when there is a, a crisis in one region, uh, the part that it is not compensated by the, the help, let's say, of the uh, evolution of other regions is much larger. And second, that, that there is no red tie. Okay, that there are no fiscal transfers, which is, uh, of course, what I was, uh, I was saying. There is no uh, way in the current uh, European monetary setting for uh, other countries or even for the central budget to compensate for what is happening in the, in the, in the region. And, um, is, this, uh, is, is it mad to think that we can construct, uh, for example, a common cyclical insurance scheme as the one that it exists here in the US with the unemployment benefits, okay, on which the central government ca uh, can play also a role uh, increasing the capacity of the uh, regional unemployment uh, uh, insurance uh, scheme? Well, I, I don't think so. I think it's, uh, it's possible to design a, a relatively simple scheme that put a, as an automatic stabilizer, and here uh, there are some simulations, I will not enter into the details, but I will just provide the main conclusions of this type of exercises. Um, and you, you don't need to have permanent transfers. So basically, uh, what you can do is to uh, create this common cyclical insurance scheme that creates a buffer when output gaps, for example, uh, unemployment gaps are, are, are positive or negative, respectively, and then you can spend the money that you have um, that you have accumulated during the expansionary period, during the recessionary uh, period, and uh, on average to be zero, okay, so not having effect in terms of the, um, in terms of the sustainability of public uh, finance. Uh, um, for example, if you look at the scheme one that uh, is illustrated here, I mean, all the details of this, if you want to know a bit more about how these, uh, these simulations were created, were uh, published in the annual report of the, of the bank, uh, that you can, uh, you can get from our uh, website. But the, the main message is, is that a relatively low contribution of 1% uh, uh, dysfunction on average through the, through the cycle would be sufficient to achieve a level of uh, overall uh, income stabilization comparable to the one observed in other existing federations. Okay? So in the, in the last part of this, um, of this table, you have the, st the stabilization capacity. And with this 1% point, you, uh, you lead to a stabilization capacity of around 37%, which is even higher than the one that I was presenting before for the, uh, for the US uh, case, or for Canada, or for uh, or even for, uh, for, uh, for Germany. Uh, maybe a final, a final point. I don't want to give the impression that all the problems of uh, the euro area uh, can be faced uh, simply by uh, demand policies, monetary policy or uh, fiscal policy. And, uh, and indeed, I, I, and, and I, think, I think this is not the, uh, this would not be the right conclusion from my presentation. And with this uh, chart, I'm trying to emphasize exactly the, the opposite. What you have in the left-hand chart is uh, the potential GDP growth of the euro area and the US, the, the, the red one is the US, the, the, new, uh, the new line is the EU area, and as you can see, there is a significant gap between the potential GDP growth of, um, of, uh, of, the, of the US and, and the EU area, being, of course, the EU area much, uh, much lower. Um, and of course, you cannot uh, confront or reduce this gap by, by demand measures, you need structural reforms. Uh, what it is important is, uh, uh, what it is in the right hand chart, is that the, this gap uh, is uh, basically concentrated on if you make a, a, a decomposition of potential GDP growth uh, between labor, uh, capital, and total factor productivity components. The three of these components are lower in the case of uh, the, uh, the EU area and the US. So uh, the main conclusion would be that apart from these demand uh, uh, policies that can play a role in order to smooth the cycle, if we want to reduce this gap, we will have to do a structural reform in all these fronts in order to increase the potential uh, uh, GDP of, uh, of uh, the EU area and the EU area. And we can do that with this. We're going to quickly open a time for Q&A. I just wanted to uh, remind everybody that given the recent political developments, we just want to keep this conversation strictly to the uh, Euro area and monetary policy. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask a question first. Um, and then I'll turn it over to the person. Then I'll, then I'll open it up to everybody else. Um, Jeremy, well, I'm going to ask you about the EU area. Um, 
fiscal unions and, and did a bit of US-Euro comparison. Um, and I was uh, very glad to see that, that um, uh, while the United States has had its um, Hamilton moment um, uh, uh, 200 years ago, um, it is a moment that is heavily revisited on a regular basis mm. um, in the United States. That's what we can see now in the current political uh, environment in the US. Um, and it's far from complete. I particularly, particularly like the last picture showing of the risk sharing, how little of the US risk sharing is actually fiscal. A huge amount of it happens in markets. Um, and that's actually, uh, uh, I wouldn't say by design, but it is an outcome of the, the, the actual lack of a, a surprisingly small amount of fiscal risk sharing that goes on. Not that it doesn't go on, but it, it certainly does. I mean, it certainly does not, unfortunately, prevent portables from happening. I'm now thinking, um, and I'm going to apologize to anybody who's in the room from the state of Louisiana, but I'm going to use Louisiana, who is, uh, which is a state that has had perpetual fiscal and, and political turmoil for a huge amount of its history. It's not a wealthy place. Its finances have been pretty poorly, public finances have been pretty poorly managed for a long time. Um, and it is sort of the perpetual version of that. And it tends, as a result, to be not particularly, if it were a country, it certainly wouldn't be very competitive. Um, that said, um, it does pay less than its fair share of taxes to the federal government and gets back in national spending more than it puts in. So there is absolutely fiscal sharing that goes on there. It's a, uh, um, so there are ways to do this, I guess, though, short of the sort of much more integrated fiscal uh, as you see in Canada, or I think that you would see in the UK across regions, for example. Um, so that's just a comment. I'd be curious as to what you, what the, the, uh, everyone thinks uh, about that uh, comment. Um, and for ideas, in addition to the one that was offered, for ways to take the first step in fiscal union, and I'd be interested in the panelists' views on that. Um, I'll hold off on my second question. I'll just ask that. Well, uh, I start. Mm -hmm. I will give, uh, I think, a much more political vision, and I think my colleagues will give a more economic rational uh, vision. Well, regarding the example of Louisiana and, and Portugal, or even Greece, I think that the main problem that the EU faces, a part of a economic and financial crisis, perhaps precisely of a, a confidence crisis. There was a moment where even a commissioner doubted about whether Greece should keep it in the Eurozone or not. Even a, fine, a, a minister of the American government had the same position, whether Greece should stay or not. In that context, it was absolutely impossible to cope with the financial uh, crisis, to cope with the economic crisis, because there was a lack of confidence in the in the Euro project. Thank goodness there was a moment <coughs> Well, it was Councillor Merkel who clearly stated that the euro was irreversible, but I think that we lost a few or even months or even a few years to try to cope the financial um, crisis, both at national level with reforms, but also at uh, European level with uh, fa deeper integration, as we mentioned, I mean, we mentioned before. And comparing it to Louisiana at that moment, uh, no matter how bad the finance situation of Louisiana was, no matter how bad the economic situation in Louisiana was, nobody in the U.S. doubt about the uh, remain or possibility or remain or not of Louisiana in a monetary union in the in the dollar zone. So that was the main problem we faced at the at the beginning. Many people question whether Mario Draghi react too late or not. I firmly believe that Mario Draghi. Uh, react when he had reasons to react. Mario Draghi didn't save the euro. Mario Draghi gave European institutions and uh, European governments time to save the euro, time to implement the reforms who made uh, the euro uh, survive. But only Mario Draghi, only with monetary, possible, uh, monetary policy, or only with, monet or with QE, was not possible to save the euro if we still had doubts about the reversibility of the of the uh, euro. Regarding fiscal 
capacity. I think we are gonna see a fiscal capacity. I think we are in a very political mood in the Eurozone with President Macron being elected in, in France with uh, uh, German government will, uh, will take on office in, in a few weeks. Some reluctant in some issues, but obviously quite pro-European. So in that context, and I firmly believe that, as uh, Fernando mentioned before, even Brexit is an, an opportunity. I freely, uh, I agree with his analysis that is too ambitious to say that every country will join the euro. But today, there is a chance that every country will join the euro. Not in 2025, as President Juncker suggests, but obviously probably sooner than, than, than uh, expected. But the problem is how to design this fiscal capacity. Obviously, there are countries who want that the European Commission uh, take the leadership on this, uh, on managing this fiscal capacity. There are countries that are more reluctant to do so, like Germany, that prefers that governments, that the Council somehow will be finally responsible for managing this fiscal capacity. But the good thing is that we are debating this. We are not debating whether there is a need of fiscal capacity or not. We are debating how to implement this fiscal capacity. And in my opinion, only this question and only this debate is, all, uh, is already a positive uh, signal. And I will stop here. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to speak like <laughs> at some point I'll have to rebut you, my friends. <laughs> because it, you know, it doesn't always work that you rebut me. Uh, but anyway, uh, Professor Marcel, thank you for, for your question. There are two, two things. Uh, I wanted to go back to the chart, which I think is what you were talking about, essentially. Uh, and one thing Pablo didn't mention, surprisingly, is uh, how little is the impact of capital yes. markets adjustment in Europe. Now, of course, there are structural reasons for this. I mean, uh, as we all know, prior to the Eurozone and prior to anything, uh, Europe is a highly bankerized uh, uh, area vis-a-vis uh, -vis the U.S. Yeah. Where, uh, capital work. But it's also because, and this is a problem that relates to, to my answer to your question, Professor Moser, is to the fact that one underlying problem to the lack of any uh, 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 risk sharing in Europe is, uh, as I like to put it, uh, it very easily, uh, as long as a euro deposit is in a bad Sp American bank, I'm uh, oh, sorry, uh, a euro deposit in a bank, German bank, which is some, is an asset of a higher quality than the same euro deposited in a good Spanish bank, which is some, uh, then we have a problem. No, no uh, uh, sharing mechanism <laughs> will work. Not even capital markets, if it were. Because at any point in time where people will flee uh, the, the bad assets uh, that is the euro deposit in Spanish bank. So we do have as a first building block to create a really functioning banking union and to make sure that the euro is an euro regardless of the nationality of the bank in which it is deposited. And that speaks to the need, to the urgent need in my view, to build the euro deposit insurance mechanism. I do not think with the resolution fund is enough for many reasons. Uh, that, that, that is what I want to, to talk about. So that's, that's one thing. The, the, the second point on, on fiscal transfers and, and and, and this, sorry, this is the Louisiana thing. I mean, the problem, the advantage, the beauty of Louisiana is that the euro deposit in Louisiana is always, a, a dollar deposit yeah. in Louisiana is as good as a dollar deposit in dollar. Yeah, and, and it's always the same dollar as the one deposited in New York. And that helps things. Uh, it does not help those who don't want to be helped. I mean, it does not change the need for the structural reforms, the need to get your house in order. I mean, that's all. But on top of that, even if you do that, with this mechanism in place. And let me, let me uh, re remind you some facts that you may have not uh, uh, heard. I mean, the, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, the deposit base of Greek banks today, even after everything that has happened, with all the mechanisms that have been put in place, banking union, the three the rescue package, etc., is less than 40% of what it used to be before the crisis. So 60% roughly of the euro deposit base in Greece banks has vanished. It's outside Greece. Uh, now, this is a problem. Uh, and it is only a problem uh, that will not be solved with any other mix unless we address clearly the banking union. So that's one thing. Uh, the, 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 uh, the amount of transfers in capital markets speaks to the need to, I think you mentioned it probably at the beginning, the need to work fast on capital markets union. Uh, the problem with that is that once, you know, we all agree on this, everybody talks about capital markets union and they need to proceed this faster. And, and again, this discussion about Brexit is interesting because we don't really know whether it will help or imperish uh, our capital market union, uh, being, being the, the UK obviously were, were the largest part of capital markets in Europe uh, take place. Uh, 
But the important thing is that when you get into the nitty gritty of advancing through capital markets union, we have two basic impediments. One is consumer protection, which is still very different in different European countries, financial consumer protection. Uh, and there is only a limited amount of capital markets union you can actually do. If not even uh, the, the, a mortgage, not a mortgage in every European country. It's a different product, not to mention any other thing. That, that is very important, you want to move the government. To be able to actually issue European products, you need to have uh, a similar or a much more convergent uh, consumer protection. And the other is, is basic uh, uh, commercial law, uh, mercantile issues. And, and uh, I see some, some lawyers in the room that, are, that know a lot more than I do about this. But, you know, there is... Uh, speak the same thing. I mean, uh, there are so many still national subsidies and discretion in capital markets that make it extremely I'm difficult. I'm going to do this from a single two fingers for one interjection. It's interesting, the United States example, you know, there's no problem with consumer protection in the retail about eight years ago. Right. Seven years ago, excuse me, in the United States. But there was but common investor protection. Right. Investor That's protection in securities and investments um, after the Great Depression, starting in the 1930s, and the same law is being used. That, that's actually an interesting differential. When yeah, no, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. For the entire mess. And then right. In 2000, the United States was lagging. But it's also, it's also an interesting point because today I don't think you can talk about consumer protection in terms of financial markets without talking about investors' protection yeah. because you know people do not save in deposits anymore. Right. Uh, they may have in the 60s, but certainly not anymore. So it's, uh, but, but it is a, a very significant point. Thanks. Now, on, on fiscal union, your second point very, very briefly. I was surprised that, uh, let me uh, sort of take, take this from, from, from the beginning. Uh, I was surprised to, to hear Pablo uh, uh, with, with coming so strong in favor of this uh, unemployment insurance mechanism. Uh, I wasn't aware of this, 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 uh, of this position uh, because I don't think it will work. Um, and certainly, most times I do agree with, with banks, uh, Bank of Spain's position on European issues. Uh, and and, and let, me, let me make this uh, clearly. Uh, the point why I don't think the insurance mechanism, the employment insurance mechanism as, as a source of the stabilization fund for Europe to build fiscal policy will not work, is that because it will create significant disincentive problems. I mean, if we are having serious political economy problems with fiscal transfers, I cannot even imagine what the, um, the, the political problem we will have with any sort of unemployment insurance mechanism being the source of fiscal stabilization in Europe. Uh, to me, it's just unimaginable that, that you know, that they, we will see a huge increase of ultra-nationalist political parties in core European countries under the pretense that, you know, you are wasting our taxpayers' money in paying unemployment benefits in those big countries in southern Europe. I, I really, I think the political backlash of that will make it impossible. Plus, the negative incentives that will create in improving our internal labor market. So I, I, I simply do not buy that idea, so that, I don't think that can work. The second approach that has been put on the table is the, the stabilization mechanism to create this European uh, monetary fund as a source of the stabilization, which essentially means we do create a European agency which is somehow independent from the European legal structure. It's not part of the Commission. It's uh, an agency of itself, the, the European Establishment Mechanism. Uh, if I'm not uh, wrong, created by an intergovernmental uh, treaty, not even in the, in the uh, sort of core uh, bylaws of the uh, statutes of the, of the Commission. Uh, and we give them uh, some additional budget and the capacity to leverage money to do that. Now, this is the, what I call the European, the International Monetary Fund approach to Europe, and I don't think it, it is even remarkable. Similar. Again, I, I cannot imagine the Louisiana problems being solved with an IMF program in Louisiana. It just does not work. It creates, again, all sorts of political backlash. So I think the, the European uh, fiscal capacity has to be built within the realm of the European law Therefore, we need to change the Maastricht Treaty to clearly address this issue. I don't think. I mean, one of the conclusions we had in the in the paper, you, you've read the book, both of you have read the book in previous edition, ever since three years ago, was that everybody agreed we need a new treaty. Now, politically, I don't know how feasible that is. Uh, I would agree with you, Pablo. It's a little more feasible today than it was two years ago, or, or a little less in, impossible than two years ago. <laughs> we, but, but you know, we're getting there. Well, we're getting there. It's the same thing with Banking Union. I mean, it was impossible five years yeah. ago. It's a fact today. So, you know, in, in Europe, we have this tendency to do things 
always too late. But so far, we've managed to do that. And I think this is important. I mean, this is one point I always try to convince my, my American friends when discussing about monetary union. Uh, are European issues? Yes, it's true. We put a cart, uh, the chart, cart before the horses. And it was ca cart or chart? The cart before the horses, so, so the cart doesn't work. But then eventually, you know, it takes time, we're slow. But uh, someone realized that we have to change the horses around. Uh, and then we do it. But the problem is the Americans never believe that we do change the horses around. <laughs> and we've done it a couple of times, and I think this will happen to the fiscal union. You know what I think will happen? A very obvious approach to this. At some point, the ECB will be faced with the, with the reality that is the only central bank in the world that I know of, and again, correct me, uh, uh, that conducts monetary policy with an asset. You know, it does not have an asset of itself. The ECB issues bills. The Central Bank of China issues uh, Bank of China, uh, POVC, or whatever they call it. Uh, every single central bank in the world issues its own asset to conduct regular monetary policy. You know, the, the, the very simple thing. You know, you issue paper, you draw it. You know, the, the, the thing we've done for the 50s. But, but, well, whatever. But, but there, is, there is a common asset for the area now. Uh, we, we work, the, the European Monetary Union worked until 2008 with the pretense of the ECB that there was a common asset, that, that you know, buy, buying German bonds or Spanish uh, uh, tesoros or Greek bonds was essential, you say. With the very, well, not, uh, we cannot prove it. So I, I, I'm, I'm sh totally convinced that at some point, soon, the ECB will be forced to create, in the new, uh, let's hope Romano Prodi is not right and we have to wait for the next crisis. But at some point, hopefully before the next crisis, the ECB will be forced to issue probably T bills, not euro bonds, but euro bills. And this will create the need, okay, once you have a bond, what do you do with it? I mean, we have debt, uh, we've issued debt, how do you finance it? How do you pay for it? What is it put to, to uh, what do we use it for? And it will con naturally lead us to have some sort of euro treasury, uh, uh, but to manage that asset. And once you have the Euro Treasury, you have sort of the, the inbuilt stabilization facility. So I, I, I really think this is how it's going to work. I think all these other <laughs> instruments, the, the ESM, some people have mentioned the European Investment Bank to actually, you know, this, this bond to be used uh, as the stabilization mechanism. Again, the, there are some institutional projects with the European Investment Bank. I mean, there are countries that do not belong to the monetary union that are members of the, the European Investment Bank. The boards are very different, uh, the also of institutional boards. So I think that we will have to address this issue. Now, uh, whether uh, I was a little disappointed, I should say, that the initial, you know, well, most of you probably know that during this year we have been in Europe the, uh, following the discussion after the, the commission paper, the, the five presidents report or whatever, uh, to, towards a single, uh, uh, what is it, towards a, an economic, fiscal uh, political union, or something like that. Uh, the famous five president report. And there were five reflection papers published on this uh, uh, so-called the Juncker approach. Uh, the last of them coming uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, so and there's been, the commission has been pushing uh, forward much more than it did before towards fiscal union. Uh, and I was a little disappointed to see that in the last paper last week, uh, the commission has backed a little bit, uh, and they are not so keen about uh, moving forward. This is probably because they've come to the conclusion. Let's face it. I mean, there is. Uh, Pablo, Pablo was mentioning this alliance between the French and the German government, uh, uh, Macron and Merkel, which is probably true. I mean, for the first time, uh, this will essentially work. Uh, but there's a problem. We have a lot of minority, uh, small uh, governments in small countries, uh, who are very reluctant to let the French-German axle decide for them. So we we'll need to strike a compromise between the German-French initiative to lead us towards a fiscal union and the fact that the small countries need to be politically represented. And again, it's a political issue. Sorry to, to take some. No. Um, well, I guess that uh, I mean this comparison between Luciana and, uh, and Portugal, um, I, I would find like uh, three type of arguments, uh, and uh, I think probably the most important one is not in this graph, which is the one that uh, Pablo was uh, also emphasizing, which is this redenomination risk, you know, the possibility uh, of, uh, of a country leaving the euro, the, 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 the euro, the euro uh, during, the, during the crisis. Um, this had to be solved by, by the ECB with this speech by Mario Draghi in, in London. 
Um, but of course, it's also very relevant uh, what uh, Fernando was saying, and I was not emphasizing this during the presentation, but in the chart, it is true that one of the main differences between the United States, Euro area, Canada, and Germany is that there is no red, uh, red bar, so that there, there is no in the Euro area fiscal channel. But of course, the capital markets uh, channel is much lower. And it's not only that it is much lower, it's that during the crisis, it declined it's right. It's right. That's because right. there was a fragmentation of, uh, of capital markets. And again, this was solved uh, by, by, two, by two measures. The first one was, of course, the creation of banking union, although incomplete. And Fernando was mentioning the fact that we still don't have an European uh, deposit uh, insurance uh, scheme. And uh, I think for me, this is a, an obvious issue that will have to be, uh, to be solved if we want uh, 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 capital market union. But uh, in practice, it was also, again, um, uh, resolved by the European Central Bank. So uh, probably one of the main uh, uh, effects of the monetary policy of the ECB has been the reduction of the pra fragmentation of uh, in terms of the interest rate that firms mm -hmm. pay uh, during, the, during the crisis as compared to, to today. So the decline in the interest rates that are paid by uh, Spanish firms, for example, are those uh, German firms that was very big the, 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 the level was much higher uh, three years ago uh, in Spain than in, than in, than in Germany. Today uh, is basically the same. And this is again due to the, to the, to the monetary policy of the, of the ECB. And maybe a final comment on fiscal capacity. Um, I do think it's possible. And I do think it's possible because you don't need to construct such a thing that uh, uh, requires permanent transfers. So this is why I don't think that there, are, there is a problem with incentives. So it's basically, uh, if I can put it in, a, in another way, is to create, it's like creating an another uh, automatic stabilizer, but at the euro area level, uh, that, uh, that do not require, is compensated through the, through the cycle. It's not that Germany is going to finance the unemployment rate of, of the Spanish economy. No, you, I mean, the, the, the simulations that I was providing is not based on, based on that. So basically, Germany and Spain are paying the same over the, 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 economic, uh, the economic cycle. Can, can I ask him a question? <laughs> well. uh, no, j just to, to, to clarify the issue, because I, I, I'm a little bit like, are you suggesting in your paper that how is this insurance mechanism being financed? Are you suggesting the Europeans will pay a premium on the current insurance? I mean, if, if no, that just, just really, I don't, I don't want to talk about it, just, just, well, I mean, just so that everybody understands what we're talking about. One, one possibility is, uh, let's say, saving during the, the expansionary mm -hmm. period. Uh, when the output gap is uh, positive and uh, spending it during the, the recessionary period when the output gap is But then there will be sort of a, an institution that will gather 1% exactly. of the uninsured payments exactly. across Europe and will keep it? The, but uh, again, the, the key issue for me, because I'm, I'm, I'm of course concerned about the, the, the practicalities of it and whether it uh, can fly from the policy perspective, is that you can construct such a thing without uh, having permanent transfers from one country to the other. So, questions from everybody else? Okay, in the back. Could you identify yourself too, please? Hi, uh, I'm, uh, my name is Achilles, I'm a student here. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, do you think it makes sense for the uh, uh, European policy minister to promote the euro as a reserve currency? Reserve currency. <laughs> it makes sense, it just will not work. <laughs> 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 uh, that's, we, we've been doing it for many, many years, and then, and uh, the, you know, one, one of the challenges of the book uh, is traditional. Let, let me do my minute of publicity, okay? Everything that we've been discussing here is in the book, so really. <laughs> <laughs> and it will even be better in the next book. <laughs> now, having said that, there, this is an issue that we address explicitly every year, you know, the, the, the role of the euro in all sorts of financial markets. And funny enough, the, the, the use of the euro as a reserve currency has not improved a bit, so roughly speaking. It is the second reserve currency in the world. Uh, this is the good view that was presented by Pablo. The negative view is still a regional reserve currency. It's basically used in Europe, not, but not in Euro countries. Uh, and I think this is, to put it very, very direct, uh, this has to do a lot with other issues. I mean, a reserve currency is not only because you have a strong currency, it's because there is a, a, an army behind, uh, there is a country that you rely on. It's very difficult to be a reserve currency of the world if the, the political union does not exist. You know, in a world of fiat currency, you know, this is a currency of a non-existing institution. So it's very difficult to really be uh, worldwide a reserve currency. Uh, and I'm sorry to say this very drastically, but... Uh, There's actually a, a little bit of um, interesting data on this. The BIS has been right. papers that have been published in the last few years. And 
was astonishing, but after the crisis, you would think after the massive dollar, U.S. dollar yeah. shortage, funding shortage, right, that sort of made what was going to be a very, very big financial crisis in the U.S. and then perhaps in Europe, truly okay. global, truly global. Um, that perhaps the use of the dollar in international transactions, capital market transactions, completely outside the U.S., even outside of yeah. Europe, would go down. It is not, it is not yeah. the percentage of global transactions. There's an interesting paper by, recent paper by one of the business school professors here looking at mutual fund holdings of corporate bonds. And if you look even outside the Euro, U.S. and the Euro area, the use of issuance of corporate bonds, both issued and held outside of those two regions, has that the share of the dollars has actually gone up, and believe it or not, in the last four years, the share of the euros is actually sh share of in euro transactions like that's actually gone down very yeah. okay, that's, I'm not, I'm not. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my name is Kingsley. I'm also a first year uh, super student. Uh, my question is about like two questions about fiscal policy. Uh, seems uh, it seems like uh, structural reform is the key to. Uh, sustain the economic growth, especially in the southern European Union countries. And but now, uh, used to be there's a retrenchment on the, the physical policy, uh, especially backed by uh, German, like uh, the, the, the Minister of uh, Finance in Germany, uh, Sch uh, Sch Schau Schauble? Schauble. Schauble, right. And recently the market is saying that because he's going to retire, so markets have been expecting that the physical stance will become more expansionary. But there is now a question of, and my question is, do you agree with this kind of statement? And the other thing is, uh, I've noticed that in Maastricht uh, rules that there is a like minus 3% fiscal deficit every year for the European countries. So, but in, practic in, in practical, we speaking, it's not working like it's in practice, because a lot of countries are past, way past the minus 3% of, uh, of this rule. So how do we recognize, uh, reconcile these two differences? Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, for, the second question is easier than the first. Uh, there's been, uh, and I thought I addressed it in my presentation, there's never been a, a binding fiscal rule. The 3% deficit is a nominal nice thing to have, but nobody pays any attention to it, essentially. There is a very, to, 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 you know, if I were to elaborate on a, on a class uh, at, uh, at here, uh, I would speak an hour and a half on the very elaborate mechanism for the uh, excessive deficit procedure and the different steps of how you know it's it's first of all diagnosis then what happens if then countries have to present a, a sort of a, 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 a adjustment program uh, then the adjustment program is not is not met and then etc et said all go on and and then to just to put it how many years has been been in the excessive deficit procedure? Uh, row? It's so it's so since 2009, so it's eight years in a row. Uh, it's fine. I mean, there's always reasons not to. Uh, in my personal view, uh, the excessive the, the fiscal rule was broken when we went, and I, you know, this can take a long, long discussion with, with Pablo because it's in the paper. One of the beauties of the paper or the book is that you you, you see very different points of view. Uh, one of the beauties that I have as editor is that then I did I. I uh, discuss in my second summary the views that every other author has and, and disagrees with them. And so so that, that thing is very interesting for the reader because then it, it gets to different points. But in this point, my, my view here, very, very rapidly, is that the moment we introduced qualifications to the 3% deficit and we went to try to measure the very sophisticated with the structural deficit rules, we blew it. Because then it really became a political discussion. Because measuring a structural deficit it's very nice for economists. It would give us a lot of work, but it's politically relevant because it's a mess. Uh, that's, that's, I'm sure you disagree with this. Now, the, 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 the other question, uh, it's at the heat of the political debate in Europe, uh, and it's at the heat of the, of the effects of unconventional monetary policy. You know, part, of the, part of the discussion is the moral hazard problem. You know, if fiscal policy, how will fiscal policy be ever, how will the high indebtedness of some European countries will ever be reduced if treasuries across Europe find it so easy to finance their debt. Why would they ever reduce the fiscal deficit? Why would the government of Spain ever take seriously reducing the deficit if the Spanish kingdom, which is not a perfection in terms of credit history, is able to finance itself at negative interest rates up to three years? Or I don't know, maybe two years now. 
Uh, so this is the moral hazard problem, and, and, and this is part of the discussion around conventional monetary policy. Yes, it was very good at the time, but maybe it is making fiscal adjustment even more complicated. So I'm not so worried about Mr. Shovel leaving. Uh, um, in terms of what type of fiscal policy we will, we will get in the future, but about this relation between unconventional monetary policy and fiscal policy. And in fact, one of the charts that it was in the presentation that I skipped was precisely that. Whenever the countries believe that uh, interest rates will be lowered or keep low for very long, whenever the markets react to the statement Pablo made, uh, Pablo read of the ECB saying interest rate will remain at this very low level for a long time, this is read in every single treasury across Europe. I shouldn't worry about the deficit. I have no problem financing it. That's my problem. I know it's not I'd yours, like, but it's my I'd like to go back to the reforms issue you mentioned. I think if we see to, uh, to the Spanish model, uh, the Spanish case, we see that there are, in my opinion, three factors which explain why Spain is growing at a pace of 3.2% in GDP. Yeah. Fiscal consolidation, reforms at national level, and obviously European integration uh, process. If you see other countries like Italy, and I think the case was mentioned before, Italy is growing at a pace of one percent now is improving a little bit the forecast, but and Spain is growing at a pace of three point two percent as I mentioned before. This gap is obviously explained partly because of the of the uh, uh, reforms implemented at national at national level. But we we have I think some lessons to take from from, from the Spanish case. And Councillor Merkel mentioned it a few a few weeks ago, and I think I think with the European se uh, semester and the coordinate. Uh, the improvement in the coordination of the economic uh, policies. Uh, what I may, what I want to to, to 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 try to explain is that the fiscal consolidation in the short term has a negative impact on growth. And I think the European semester, that is the, the tool to coordinate the European uh, Eurozone economic policy, has a, uh, somehow still some improvements to be implemented and this is linked also to moral moral hazards. What I, do I mean? For example, I think that we should give more flexibility to those countries who are implementing reforms. Some uh, flexibility at, uh, from the fiscal point of view. How to do so to avoid moral hazards? I would like to go back to the um, fiscal capacity at European level. What um, Councillor Merkel suggested a few weeks ago it was that some countries like Spain that had to implement reforms, that had to implement fiscal consolidation process uh, and, and uh, had, uh, had uh, to implement some measures who affect productivity. For example, in the case of Spain, reduce the budget uh, on uh, R&D or innovation. And what Councillor Merkel suggested is that we must open the debate about the fiscal uh, 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 capacity at, the, at European level to try to cope with these imbalances. So those countries who are implementing reforms, those countries who are implementing fiscal consolidation pro process have a tool at European level, for example, in the case of Spain, to try to get funds from that fiscal capacity at European at Eurozone uh, level to push investment in R&D or innovation in uh, Spain. There are people who think that we should give more flexibility from the fiscal point of view to those countries who are implementing reforms. But this we have seen in the in the history, in the short history of the Eurozone, that not always is easy due to reasons like uh, moral hazard. So at this respect, I think there is an opportunity from my perspective now to implement a fiscal capacity which is a tool to somehow try to avoid this moral hazard that uh, has proven a reality at national level to those countries who are not so, let's say, uh, frank uh, on, on, on his public uh, policies, public expenditure policies. I have a question. We've been talking a lot about normalization and the Fed coming out, reducing its balance sheet size and coming back to raising rates. What additional problems will the ECB have given its structure when that moment comes? Um, well, I mean, 
you mean uh, if there is a decoupling of the of the situation in the U.S. as compared to the euro area? Or no, when the euro area has to reduce its balance sheet and raise rates, given its mm. structure, how serious is the decoupling? How possible is the decoupling? No, I mean I, I guess uh, the 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 element uh, that could be uh, different uh, from the from in the case of the euro area as compared to the U.S. is the fact that of course we have this regional dimension, let's say, or national dimension that. Uh, that's not uh, the case in the in the US, uh, and of course, yes, there are. Uh, the, I think this is a, is a point that should be taken into account. That when normalization um, takes place, uh, there might be the possibility of a start uh, uh, to see again some fragmentation, for example, in the interest rates that are paid by different by different countries. Um, I, I tend to think, of course, this is a this is a risk, and this is why, for example, in the case of Spain, we are emphasizing at the bank that uh, fiscal consolidation should take place. The debt to GDP ratio is uh, already very high, close to 100%, three times the level before the, the crisis. If interest rates start to increase, of course, this, this will have a, a negative if, if, uh, effect on interest payments, uh, uh, etc. Um, but uh, my perception is that when this normalization will take place, also the, the economy will be, uh, the periphery country uh, economy, uh, those of uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy, etc., will be in a much better shape as well in order to face this, uh, this problem. Just to take an example, uh, uh, household debt and uh, non corporate and, and corporate debt in the uh, Spanish case has declined by 50 percentage points of GDP since the, uh, since the, the, the beginning of the, of the crisis. So if there is a, uh, an increase in interest rates, normalization derived from the normalization of monetary policy, households and firms will be in a much better position. To face this, uh, this yeah, I, I agree with what Pablo was saying. Uh, I think the the real question uh, for Europe at the point is uh, what the regional dimension, and it really I I issues or brings us to the issue of remaining fiscal vulnerabilities in different countries. Uh, but again, the, the, my problem is. Uh, you know, uh, and you know this, Pablo. We, we, we for lo for a long time, we we mean in the academics or or even people at the central bank, etc., are putting uh, up on the discussion the fact that the fiscal vulnerability of Spain has not improved significantly in, in the last years, uh, and the response is, why should I? Uh, why should we? Uh, so uh, I'm really concerned about how much serious improvement we will see in reducing the deficit or the debt with this area, especially because the perception among the, the European taxpayer at large, and certainly the, 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 or the European voter, certainly the Spanish voter, is fiscal adjustment has already happened too long and too harsh. Uh, and we're, asking, we're basically trying to convince the population it hasn't been enough. Uh, and that, that from an economic, political economic point of view is interesting. But to me, yes, to me, the real puzzle for monetary policy, Gonzalo, is not what will happen in Europe when interest rates in the US go up. Uh, the real puzzle is how come is it possible for a central bank to justify to have negative interest rates when GDP growth is at its potential, when unemployment is at a historical low, uh, because we're basically saying is the only thing that we care about is inflation. Since inflation rate is below 2%, then I don't care whether the unemployment rate is at, at the historical lows or GDP potential is at this level. Uh, and I, uh, I don't care how much distortions I create in the functioning markets, because the beauty of the, of, you know, the ECB purchase program is very nice, but the fact of the matter, and it has significantly reduced fragmentation in Europe. Certainly, true. But it's also true that a lot of financial submarkets in Europe only work because the ECB is still today the dominant player. And that is not, to me, a, a sustainable recovery. So we need to start unleashing uh, the, the, the force of the market, uh, and we need to realize that the interest rates, uh, the, the current monetary policy is simply uh, at the level of a nuclear war when the economy is in a, better, in, in a sort of a, a stable growth uh, position. And of course we will see problems, but... Uh, no, somebody, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. One last. Um, I'm Alfredo, first year two of, of CIPA. One, one question to Professor Fernandez. Um, you, uh, what, for what, I, with, what we've heard, you don't think the, the, the unemployment insurance will be probably one of the best ways. 
or policies, because you will create probably some ultra-nationalist parties and reactions. However, uh, don't you think that the, in general, the fiscal union can generate those reactions, and, and in fact is generating those reactions already? Yeah, uh, no, so very, 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 very clear. Uh, I don't think it works first because it creates a nationalist problem. Second, I don't think it works, but I don't think it's a good idea uh, to <laughs> structure to have a, a stabilization fund that is linked to unemployment. Third, it is a tax. And I think, if, if anything, labor markets in Europe are already overtaxed. Because we should not forget that uh, the, the steady unemployment rate across Europe is significantly, it's about twice the steady state unemployment rate in the US. And it does have something to do with the fact that institutions in the labor market are already not perfect. Uh, uh, so it, it is an avenue I don't want to, to work on. Of course, any, any, any progress in fiscal policy will create problems. Uh, nationalism. But I guess at some point, the Europeans will have to decide. And that's why I said we are at a, at a point where political scientists have a lot more to say about the Euro than economists. Uh, and, and it is a lot about building political institutions. It's about building political credibility. And it's about using political capital. My only problem is, uh, I hope it doesn't take another big crisis uh, for these political institutions to be built. Uh, but certainly we do need uh, uh, political institutions to, to be able to talk about a fiscal policy. Okay. Thank you all very, very much. Um, uh, this was a great discussion. Um, I really enjoyed it. I hope everybody else did as well. Thank, Thank you. you.